If you want to dig a grave for Christianity, what you do is you put people outside the Word and out from under the Word. Mm. And whether you're a Kantian that places the, uh, <clears throat> the primacy in reason, or whether you're a Schleiermachian who puts the primacy in feeling, either one of those that are not ruled by the Word of God can kill you. Once you get into this journey toward the self, um, then then the self, the, the autonomy of the self is going to be prominent. And what happens when that's prominent inevitably is going to be chaos. One of the things that Bill taught us was to anticipate the questions of your audience. And uh, that really gets you uh, on their heart ground. Where are they? What are the questions they're asking? And he would speak in terms of uh, getting them to, dis to disclose where they really were at. And then by your conclusion, uh, homecoming, inviting them onto your ground, the ground of faith in Jesus Christ. Welcome to The Pastor and the Modern World, a podcast from Westminster Theological Seminary. I'm your host, Peter Lilback, president here at Westminster. Over the next few episodes, we'll be exploring together a new book from Westminster Seminary Press called The Pastor and the Modern World. In this short book, three accomplished scholars, William Edgar, R. Kent Hughes, and Alfred Poirier, have each contributed a chapter exploring the challenges of today and answers from the past, all with the intent of helping the church minister for Christ today's culture. Join me as we talk about the pastor and the modern world. Well, it's really a great joy to sit down and converse about our new book, The Pastor and the Modern World. And so uh, Dr. Oliphant, my friend Scott, teaching apologetics for many, many years here at Westminster, a theologian, author. <clears throat> Todd Rester, a fellow church historian who's a much better historian than I ever was or want to be, and he knows far more, but I'm older than him, so I can kind of pretend like I'm in the club, but it's great to have you as part of our faculty. Thank you. And John Curry, a man who's uh, plenipotentiary at Westminster. He has been a dean, he's been a student, he's been a faculty member, he's been a board member. We sent him off to rescue a church, and he comes back to now plan our pastoral theology program. I have to, the Lord's really blessed you, John. Thank you. Privileged to be here. Okay. Well, it's an honor to be with each of you. Thank you for the fellowship. And I'm going to look to you, Scott, because uh, the Boyer Chair Lectures began on uh, the lecture of Bill Edgar coming to serve as the first uh, uh, professor who filled the John Boyer Chair of Culture and Evangelism. And he gave a lecture entitled, Are We Really Secular? <clears throat> And I think before we talk about it, I'd love for you to share just a little bit about who Bill is and what he's done, because uh, his life is part of the apologetic in one sense of Westminster, just the way God has shaped him and used him. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, Bill's a remarkable man in so many ways. Um, I've never met anybody like him, may not meet anybody like him again. He's, um, he's a theologian, uh, deep and rich. Uh, he's also uh, an expert on jazz. His newest book is just out on jazz and I the just gospel. Got it. Yep. Yeah, who could write a book on jazz and the gospel? I know one person <laughs> and he's written it. Um, so Bill's a remarkable man with, with an incredible background. He's, he's been here, just retired, but been here over 30 years now and really shaped the apologetics department in significant ways and shaped uh, thousands of students, uh, not only here, but uh, but Bill's well-traveled. I'm not sure there's a country he hasn't been to. There might be, but he's been everywhere and, um, and spoken and continues to publish. So we're thankful for Bill's ministry. <clears throat> One of the most amazing things to me about Bill, uh, partly because of my background, is that he became a Christian sitting across the table like this with Francis Schaeffer. Mm. Uh, a wandering uh, uh, Harvard student in uh, Switzerland comes uh, to Labrie, and uh, there's Dr. Schaefer before he was as big as he was, as well known as he was, and um, and he and he and Bill have a conversation, and it changes his life. That that makes Bill uniquely uh, capable in the area of culture and evangelism because there's Schaefer kind of a cultural hero of mine. He was one of the first, he was the first thoughtful Christian I ever read. Mm. And, um, and, there's, and there's Schaefer sharing the gospel with Dr. Edgar. And, and that, that one conversation, think of what has happened. Uh, what a wonderful life, as they say. All of the people that have been influenced um, through Schaefer, but also by 
Dr. Edgar, and I'm one of those. So um, I, I've been, it's been a privilege to work with Bill these 30 years, and he's going to be deeply missed. And there's a sense in which Cornelius Van Til, one of the professors of the early years of Westminster, right up through his death, uh, shaped both you and also Bill Edgar. How does Van Til play into this story just in a brief sort of way? Yeah, well, um, I think it was Bill's uh, good, wise decision when he wanted to be theologically educated to come to Westminster Seminary. He was aware that there were differences between Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Van Til. Um, those are, are intramural kinds of things and um, worthy of discussion. Uh, but um, Van Til influenced um, Dr. Edgar and some of his friends, Dick Kyes and others, uh, significantly for the rest of his ministry. I think what Van Til helped Bill see was um, Van, uh, Schaefer was excellent on worldview. Van Til's excellent on getting to the root of some of the issues that we, we won't want to try to probe and think about in a Christian way. And I think um, Van Til urged Bill in that direction and in that sense shaped Bill in the way that he offers critiques of culture and theology and philosophy and all sorts of things. That's great. <clears throat> all right, well, I just want to look at the, the title. And so John is a um, preacher. Is it a good idea to start a lecture with a question? Are we really secular? Yeah. Is that a good, good approach, do you think? Yeah, I think it's a great approach um, coming from a great apologist. You know, one of the things that uh, Bill uh, taught us, and I was one of Bill's students at one point, and one of the things that Bill taught us was to anticipate the questions of the audience. And uh, that really gets you uh, on their heart ground. Where are they? What are the questions they're asking? And, and he would speak in terms of uh, getting them to, dis to disclose where they really were at. And then by your conclusion, uh, homecoming, inviting them onto your ground, the ground of faith in Jesus Christ. So I think it's a great way to, to, to start a sermon, particularly coming, or a lecture, particularly coming from a guy like Bill. It's anticipating the heart question of your audience. Okay. So as we get started, and I'd love to have just a round robin discussion, I'll throw out a couple ideas, but Todd, I'm gonna ask you this. Uh, he opens his lecture uh, in the lead lecture in our book, The Pastor in the Modern World. His lecture is, Are We Really Secular? And he basically says, the museum has taken the place of the church. Mm -hmm. Now you're a church historian. You must like museums. Why not? Well, uh, it's interesting. Uh, the museum was a place to go for inspiration. It was a place in the 19th and 18th centuries, a place to go be inspired, to be motivated to go do something advantageous for culture or for yourself or something like that. So the idea that uh, mm -hmm. the modern is, is casting about looking at artifacts of times past to find inspiration, that's a very fitting manage. That the church was a living community and the museum is a, is a, is a place of relics. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very interesting <clears throat> metaphor to start a conversation like this. So that the modern is, in fact, the postmodern and whatever we want to call the modern is actually in mourning over their relics. Okay. And as we, so they're as looking we think, for life. As we think about the mourning about the church, <clears throat> I, I think we all have a sense. We look at the church and say, there, there's a struggle going on. Maybe mm -hmm. less attendance, maybe more fighting, maybe less vision. Yeah. What do you think? Is that fair to say? Do you feel that? Uh, given the last several years, I think it's accentuated issues that were already present. Um, the, the, whether or not people are casting about not in a museum in a place, but whether they're looking for a museum online. Um, they're looking for a place for inspiration and they're casting about through all these various venues of entertainment. Um, yes, there's, there's, a, there's an aspect of it where the museum has now become conceptual and digital. Okay, um, so, so Scott, Give us what is the classical theory of secularization, which is kind of the thesis that Bill begins to engage. Yeah, it. Um, you know, he, he mentions in there. I think uh, Peter Berger is such a prominent figure in in these discussions, and and Os Guinness, Bill's friend and ours, um, did his dissertation on on Berger's views of secularization. Berger eventually said that he had it he had it wrong in some ways because he links secularization. Uh, inextricably with modernity, and the two don't necessarily go hand in hand. But what I what I've loved about um, Berger and and mainly Guinness and 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 Edgar's um, emphasis is the the sociology of secularization. So mm -hmm. you make a distinction, I think, sometimes between the secular 
uh, which is sort of a static uh, idea and can be interpreted in various ways between the secular and secularization. And one of the things that Bill wants to, to bring out here, but I think he does bring out very well, as he says, is the journey toward the self. Uh, and and any, anyone living in, in today's United States will, will see that in, in almost every facet of our, our world right now. And it's probably the case that it's going on worldwide. <clears throat> you know, you, you look, for example, at what's happening in Sri Lanka right now. Why is there a constitutional crisis? Uh, well, because of corruption, but it's descended into chaos rather than into just another election. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that has something to do with what Bill talks about in here, you know, the revolutionary spirit that comes with a kind of secularizing tendency or secularization in society. So I think once you, once you get into this journey toward the self, um, then, then the self, the, the autonomy of the self is going to be prominent and what happens when that's prominent inevitably is going to be chaos and it's going to be group chaos. I think Romans one thirty two says something about that. When you, when you continue to reject and suppress what God has made clear uh, through everything that he's made, what you also do is you find others who do the same thing and you join together and you band together and now misery loves company. And so we're all together in this yeah, yeah. secularizing tendency, this secularization. So, um, as Bill makes uh, clear here, the sort of standard view of secularization may or may not be as uh, accurate or as adequate. Um, he does mention uh, church growth happening in so much of the world today. Um, but, you know, as, as I was reading it, um, you, you think about, for example, um, we all have friends uh, in China and uh, what what's going on in China? We think things are, are difficult here and they are, but uh, so many of them are having to profess their faith and, and conduct their ministries underground. Yeah. Um, that's how hostile things are above ground. Uh, so, you know, you, that is that secularization? Well, of course it is. It's a submersion, submersion of biblical truth. And, and I think that's happening around the world right now and certainly happening in our country. It's a sense in which marginalization and secularization uh, go together in the sense the more the, the uh, culture becomes secular, the, the less relevant the church is to its agenda. Mm -hmm. how, how do you see that in, in your church history, John, as you think back as a pastor and a professor, would you say that's fair? I think one of the, it was interesting, the, the analogy that Bill used, you brought up where uh, the museum has replaced the church. I think one of the root problems is when the church replaces the museum. And rather than being a movement on mission, it decides that it's going to be, you know, it's, Schaefer talked about the church retreating within the citadel, drawing up the drawbridge and just lobbing rocks at the culture. Hmm. And I think one of the great challenges that has perhaps uh, not equipped us well to deal with secularism and deal with these challenges in the culture is where we previously retreat and the church actually becomes a museum. And we're looking at ourselves. Now, my good friend, Dr. Rester knows there's nobody loves church history. No pastor loves church history more than I do. Um, and we need to stand on the shoulders of the past. I think the problem is when we try to live in the past and try to preserve that, and we're not actually being, to use the title of the book, the pastor in the modern world, uh, then when we become a museum, and we're looking at ourselves and looking at our relics, then we're not equipped to deal with the challenges and the secularism that comes. So I think that's part of the picture. Okay, so there's a sense in which uh, the church becomes a museum because it dies and no one's going and the old building yeah. is taken and there's right. a sense in which we decide to become a museum yeah. where we're just gonna preserve ourselves and our tradition right. Right. and not care about anybody else. Right. Peter Berger, I think, got shocked if I, if I remember Bill's argument right by the fact of the Islamic revolution. Here's this modern country that's developing all of a sudden, goes back to medieval Islam overnight and repressive, and that's religiosity at the highest level. How could that happen? So, so Todd, tell us, how does Islam fly in the face of the secularization theory as you would put it together as you look at it? Well, the coming off the French Enlightenment um, and some of the major thinkers there, and of course you can pre go back further to the continent of Europe and history, of thought, um, but one of the things that the assumption of the of the modernist and and of the Enlightenment thinker was that as rationality was on the rise, 
the superstition would recede. Religion is necessarily superstitious. And there's another political turn here in the in the in the um, Enlightenment period, and especially in France, the idea was that it was the religious that was the impulse towards violence. So that if you have religion, there you have violence, there you have superstition. So the more rational that we so are... So let me clarify, a, a basic theory of the Enlightenment is that religion and violence are inseparable. Is yes. that fair to say? Yes. And so the Enlightenment plan is get rid of religion and we won't have violence in culture. Is that Correct. fair to say? Correct. Okay. That, and you see that you see that project going on throughout the 1780s and 90s in France, the attempt to to expunge uh, religion in any of its organized forms and to have some sort of civil religion. Now you can talk a little bit about how that's permeated. The guillotine the, really produced a lot of peace in France, didn't it? Oh well, yes, <laughs> liberty, fraternity, equality, ou mort um, that was one of the slogans in the period. Um, but the 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 the, the, I, the connection there is that the idea that religion, as rationality increases, will recede into the background is it was a was a plank in a lot of secular theory, and what the rise of Islam shows in the last 40, 50 years is that um, secularism is having to reinvent itself. Um, religion is not going away, much to their dismay. Um, religion in general, so they're not just opposed to Christianity; they're opposed to all forms of religion. Now there's, um, there was a striking moment in, I was watching French television um, back in 2018 when I was there, and uh, the argument that was going on in the news discussion was about whether or not you were French first or religious. And the, they had brought on a gentleman who said, I'm French first and then I'm also a Jew. I'm also Jewish in my religion. I'm, I'm, I've practiced Judaism. So it was interesting to me that part of the secularism is the demand for first and loyal allegiance. Um, and then religion is whatever you want to fill in the blank on your spare time. Everyone needs a hobby. You know, so the, the idea that your religion should actually shape your life and the way you think and, and the way you live and should inform society. Um, for the sociologist, religion is something that has to be controlled. Um, not necessarily as a, it's not necessarily something that's viewed as a positive. Um, it's viewed as a mechanism of power. So in that sense, the modern and the secular does come with a sense of alienation. Uh, and, I, and I love the way that Edgar brought that out, Bill brought that out so wonderfully to, to point out that there comes with this emphasis on technique, this emphasis on all these other things, um, that it, you lose the community and you lose the church what makes the history of the church interesting is the fact that it was a living church. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, the, the, we don't want dead museums <laughs> yeah. as churches. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Scott, as I think about the Enlightenment project, we come back to that famous uh, philosopher, Immanuel Kant, that kind <clears throat> of <throat> broke the world into two different worlds. Kind of re replay that philosophical concept and how that helps to shape the theory of secularization from an Enlightenment perspective. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Kant uh, was such a unique uh, figure in history, um, partly because he's on the heels of two philosophical movements, both of which have failed. Rationalism's failed, so philosophers are tired of that. They get into the empirical. Uh, David Hume is the last prominent one of those, and his view is obviously skeptical, leads to skepticism. Even he recognized that, as did his contemporaries. So Kant comes along and is reading David Hume and says, you know, the guy has some good points, but there's some, some things he's not, uh, he's not um, uh, helping us with. And Kant develops uh, his philosophy. And, you know, it, it, it's hard to know. It's so, such a complex situation. My, my own view is Kant's philosophy is a well-articulated view of what's been happening in the world since Genesis 3. Um, but, but he puts it in such a way that um, even if you haven't read Kant, it's going to resonate eventually. And as I say, it, it'll, it'll grow legs and walk the streets because it filters down in, into various kinds of ideas. All that Kant all was, was doing really uh, was uh, promoting a, a, philosoph a very well-articulated philosophical view of relativism. Some people even called it solipsism. But the way that he did that was that he wanted to um, he wanted to refute Hume's 
a notion that there's there's no uh, knowledge of cause and effect because he knew we had to have knowledge of cause and effect. So how do you refute that? Well, you you focus on phenomena in the world, and that that elevates science to a particular place, and that carries on historically. But then, what? Why does he do that? He says, "I want to, I want to do this. I want us to understand, to delimit or define knowledge in order to do what? Make room for faith." And, and whenever I, I speak to students about this, um, one of the things that that I say to them is, "How many of you think that there's a bifurcation in our culture between knowledge and faith?" It's there, it's there in spades, it's prominent. Uh, when all else fails, pray. In other words, you've got all this you can do, you've got science, you've got all kinds of remedies and ideas and they're all there and available. But if those don't work, you you sort of um, catapult to the mystical. You have the Hail pray. Mary pass, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so faith, at, in, in Kant's structure, faith is really uh, devoid of knowledge. You know that there must be something there for Kant, it was, you know, the transcendental self, things in themselves, and God. Those were all up there in the noumenal, and you had to know that there was a noumenal, but you couldn't know anything about the noumenal. There was a transcendental necessity for it, but no knowledge of it. So so Kant, I think Kant's view, you know, you extend that into phenomenology. Um, Todd mentioned Sartre. You've got all this moving forward that sets the stage for what we've experienced in the postmodern and are now experiencing in what Bill calls the journey toward the self. It turns you absolutely completely inward. Yeah. And that started in, in the modern world, that started with Descartes, I think, therefore I am, but he couldn't get outside of the cogent. How do you get outside of the I think? Um, and that moves to Kant and then to the present day. And so I, th I think when you, you see this now um, uh, obsession with identity, that's utterly Kantian. It just it, it's what Kant leads you to, and it's yet, what leads you to. It's okay, where you're so going to go. Let's. I think Bill brings in here the work of Max Weber, interestingly mm -hmm. too. And one of Weber's ideas is he said the Protestant movement is responsible for some of this too, <clears throat> and he says it's basically uh, they got rid of all the superstitions of Rome, and they became, if you will, the grave diggers for God. Okay. John, what, what do you think? Did, did Protestantism prepare the way for saying eventually Nietzsche was right? We don't need God anymore. We got rid of all the superstitions of Rome and we're left with the Bible, but oh, where's God and all the problems? Finally, the day comes. We've just dug the grave for God and yeah. that's modern liberalism. God yeah. is irrelevant. How would you respond to that? Well, my mind actually as the conversation was going on and uh, on this I went to Abraham Kuyper Stone Lectures. Okay. And I, so I'd imagine it would depend on how one sees Protestantism. Uh, Protestantism. Um, the, um, you know, Kuyper's argument was that the only uh, worldview that brings it all together and the only combatant of secularism is biblical Calvinism. And so that's what I think of when I think of Protestant is uh, biblical Calvinism. And in fact, Kuyper in those uh, Stone Lectures, and it's so appropriate to talk about Kuyper and, and those uh, engagement with culture when you're talking about Bill Edgar, because that's what he's done. Bill has brought biblical Calvinism to culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kuiper argued that it's actually only biblical Calvinism and a thorough uh, Calvinistic worldview that will preserve freedom. And uh, so I don't think it's right to look at Protestantism and say that's the source. I, it may be certain species, mm -hmm. but I think, and, and again, I think that's why what we're doing here at, at this institution and what we're doing in this book as we bring uh, these lectures to pastoral theology and to connect with the culture, when you're trying, I, th I think Kuiper was right. I think the biblical system of Calvinism uh, is the answer to secularism and is actually the way to preserve uh, freedom. It was, as Todd was speaking about, you know, you get, re you get religion out of culture and you get, you get peace and you get freedom and how that worked in the French Revolution. I'm looking at the revolution that's going on right now and saying, how's that working? You know, um, the guillotine and cancel culture. Yeah. And um, so it, ju it just doesn't bear out. So I would be more inclined to go with Abraham Kuyper okay. and what he said. So that raises the point then is that while Bill doesn't address Schleiermacher, Todd, it seems like Schleiermacher is the post-Kantian theologian that brings you totally to yourself and said there is no objective knowledge of God. It's just our sense of experience of him and feeling. And if God is only what you feel, well then pretty soon, if your feelings aren't there, you have have a, a grave dug for God. How do you respond to that? 
Well, I think um, if you want to dig a grave for Christianity, what you do is you put people outside the Word and out from under the Word. Mm. And whether you're a Kantian that places the, uh, <clears throat> the primacy in reason or whether you're a Schleiermachian who puts the primacy in feeling, either one of those that are not ruled by the Word of God can kill you mm. um, So and can kill a church. Um, you can see the crisis of experience in some of these issues in Kierkegaard, post-Schleiermacher and these things. So the autonomy of Gefühl, you know, um, the feeling, um, the, that is where the culture lives. If it feels good, do it, is, is the mantra of our marketers. Um, felt needs is the way that things are bought and sold in their culture. Um, so there's a, there's a very real sense in which this issue of modernity and the issue of, of focus and this ageness, <clears throat> anything that's not ruled by the word, uh, and, and submissive to the Word of God is going to cause problems. Okay, so you know, at, at that point, it's interesting, Scott. Earlier, you mentioned Rakan is just working out Genesis three in his own secular sort of way, and that reminded me as we came to the end of Bill's lecture, he goes to the scriptures and he says mm. these things are in the Word of God, mm. which is remarkable. Here he is; he's on the cutting edge of thinking of all these thinkers, and he said. Listen, the scriptures have addressed these things. How do you respond to that? Is, isn't it kind of amazing? And would you agree? I would agree. I, I think, you know, one of the things one of the Bill brings out so well is um, no matter what your theory is or has been, that the need for transcendence will not go away mm. um, in, in, in people's lives. Mm. Um, it's always going to be there. Um, you know, we think about uh, the way the way the culture thinks about marriage now, for example, um, why why even have marriage? What what's the what's the importance? Well, the importance is love, and love is supposed to be sort of the transcendent quality. And then uh, now in our country, your the view of freedom is therefore anybody must be able to participate it in it in any way they want to. Well, love's the transcendent, but the transcendent has to be ruled and gauged according to who God is and what he mm -hmm. said. So, uh, you know, the reason there's transcendence everywhere is because, is because everyone knows God. And so there's, there's going to be that embedded in the soul of every individual. And then because of our sin nature apart from Christ, we're going to suppress that and it's going to turn into something mm -hmm. that looks maybe a little bit like it, but is actually going to be an ugly replica of mm -hmm. it. So, when, when Bill goes to the scriptures, he, he recognizes, as we all must, that God has spoken. And when God speaks, we're meant to listen as his creatures. And when we listen, then there's freedom, mm. then there's love, then all of these things that we want transcendently, we find are found in him and given to us in the, in the Lord Jesus. And, and, and this is Bill's, this is the beauty of what Bill's able to do. He can do this with jazz, he can do it with culture, he can do it with all sorts of things. Yeah. Well, as you talk about it, this article uh, brings us to the Great World's Fair in London with the big crystal uh, Hyde Park structure. And then the French had to outdo it and they had the Eiffel Tower, the magnificence of the self and the human culture. And then the art that Bill describes, the different paintings of Impressionism. I mean, this this is truly a Renaissance work. I mean, when I read it, I'm saying, man, I got to go back to school. There's <laughs> yeah. stuff there. How does he know all this stuff? Yeah, yeah. But it's so fun. But you come to the end, and, and Scott, he, he takes us to Romans 1 again, yeah. which seems to be like a paradigm text on this. And that's something you meditate a lot. And how, how would you see Romans 1 as, if you will, as something of a paradigm to describe the secularization of culture, which Paul wrote all long ago at the birth of the Christian era. Yeah, I mean, people have said it that, you know, at least in, in the West right now, it's looking more, the West is looking more and more like the first century when, when Christians uh, were, were first around um, because of the hostilities that are are there in the culture and, and, and the decadence that's there in the culture and the corruption of the government that's there in the culture. Um, so it's, you know, it's just a fascinating thing to me, the more I've thought about it, uh, that uh, the book of Romans is, um, is so influential in the history of the church. Um, uh, Augustine wouldn't have been converted, humanly speaking, without Romans 13. Uh, Luther, an Augustinian monk, uh, you, you've got Romans playing a central role there, Wesley and others. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is because um, when Paul's writing, he hasn't been there yet. Um, so you've got that, and he wants to be there. 
um, will be there, but he hasn't been there. He says, I long to see you. Um, and so he's, the, the Spirit's inspiring him. I don't want to lose that part of it, to think about this church in, in a way that's both the centrality of the church and the necessity of that church grasping the gospel um, in, in a way that he wouldn't have to think, for example, about Corinth in the way, because he's, you know, he's been there. So, so he opens Romans, yeah, beginning in verse 18, uh, with the reality of what our sin is, but also our sin in relation to being the image of God, and also in relation to the way that sin plays out in the culture. Paul's giving in Romans 1 and 2, he's giving readers and the Lord's giving the church the, the way to exegete your culture. Um, and so that's why it's so seminal in, in the way that we think about depravity. Uh, it's, it's not enough for pastors and Christians to say everybody sins. Yes, we do. But scripture gives us some pretty definitive ways to think about sin and its implication and application in the lives of people who, who are apart from Christ. So I think that's one of the reasons why, why Paul wants to start with, the, with the, the recognition that all people know the true God because they're image of God. Mm. If, if, if God makes man in his image, male and female, he's not going to have a situation where those people do not know the one they're meant to image. He's going to make sure if you're the image of God, you will know me to such an extent that you know what you're meant to image and how you're meant to be according to that image. And that's what Paul's saying. They know God. God makes himself known because he's saying, you're still my image. You're a sinner, but you're still my image. And so you're meant to mirror my character in these particular ways. But Paul says, they, they don't, you know, we don't do that apart from Christ. Uh, in our sins, we won't honor God. We won't give thanks. Instead, what we'll do is we'll hold that down, suppress it, and he has two places, verse 23, 25, where he says we exchange, we exchange that truth. We exchange it for a lie. We exchange uh, the glory. He puts it this way. It's so magnificent. The glory of the immortal God. That's mm. Paul's language for the truth mm. that all people have within. It's the glory of the immortal God. And glory, by the way, is another way of thinking about the image of God biblically. So we exchange the glory of the immortal God for what? For icons and images and idols. And We're this is what Bill gets <clears throat> Our hearts are incurably idol factories. Idol Calvin factories, yeah, right. Cal right. just a brilliant way to put it. We're just continually manufacturing idols. And that's the way we're meant to read what's happening in our culture. There is idolatry in every in a person's heart apart from Christ, such that they're always creating something else. What is an idol? It's something you're going to worship. Paul says, worship and serve. It's not just, I want to go before this thing and say, thank you. I'm going to attach myself to this idol in such a way that it becomes my master. Mm -hmm. I now serve this thing. Mm -hmm. So when, when you look at, at some of the demonstrations, not only in our country, but around the world, what's going on? There's a service to a master that is a worshipful experience for these people, such that if they let it go, they think they lose the meaning of their lives. And Paul's saying, no, that's that's a product of our sinfulness. Mm. That's that's mm. a condition of our own hearts. Mm. And that and that's one of the reasons I think why Paul uses in the first place the example of homosexuality. That's that's a a nice way, I shouldn't put it that way, that's a vivid way to explain Genesis one to three gone wrong. Genesis 1 to 3, God created male and female. Image of God, male and female. You're going to suppress that? What's going to happen? Male on male, female on female. See, it's the, it's, it's the attempt to reverse the order of creation such that the wrath of God is extended to people and he, res he no longer restrains And that. Scott, secularization <laughs> is, if anything, an attempt to undo the order that God has given us. Would you say that's true? I would say that's exactly right. Yeah, suppressing it means I will not have God in my thoughts. I will not have God before my face. So, so what do you do when you suppress? You want to push yourself away from reality as far as it's possible for you. And that's where we are. So, our, our so let's go back to Genesis 1. Be fruitful and <clears throat> multiply becomes be sterile and abort. Yeah. Have husband and wife says no, same sex attraction. Male and female becomes 
fluidity of gender. Yeah. The value of working the garden becomes work is curse. Get away from it and let the government take care of you. Exactly. The journey. And all, journey we're pushing to away. So what you said, we go back to Genesis three. Hey, all the philosophy grows right out of that. What do you? What do we mean? When we use the phrase the noetic effects of sin. That's an important philosophical idea. What, is, what does that imply? That's very, very important. It, it means that even in our thinking, even in our reasoning, we suppress the truth yeah. in unrighteousness. You know, Van Til has this great illustration. He gives the illustration of a, of a saw, um, you know, a table saw or something like that, that cuts well, but is always set at the wrong angle. So, so how do you how do you think about that in 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 the world? And you know, I, the illustration I gave a few minutes ago, people think that love is important, good for them. It is. God is love, but what they don't understand is love can't be free floating and and defined by the individual person because God is love. Therefore, He defines what love is and how it's meant to be applied. So. You know, in, in those kinds of situations, I think what you're seeing is what Van Til calls a rational, irrational dialectic at the root of everyone's thinking. Um, because when you suppress the truth, that's going to move you toward irrational, but you can't hold it down completely without, you can't ever do it, but you might think you could do it, Camus' point, the only serious question left is suicide. You might think that will do it, it won't, because there you'll be before the face of God. An eternal soul you can't run from. Right. Yeah. So we'll always be image of God. We'll always be Coram Dale before the face of God. Uh, so what you do is you create your own personal view of transcendence. Mm -hmm. I love and therefore I should love anybody I want to love. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a suppression of the truth and unrighteousness. Schaefer has this great example where he's talking on a ship uh, to a, a person who is a radical materialist. And they're having this debate, this back and forth. And, and the man says, you know, it's time for him to retire and go, go to bed. And Schaefer says, before you do that, I have one question. When you go back to the cabin and see your wife, how in the world can you know that you love her? It's a great question to ask a materialist. What is love when everything's matter? You know, because if everything's matter, nothing matters. It's just material, period, the end. Um, so, yeah, that's a, but I think that's what Genesis 1, Genesis 1 to 3 interpreted in Romans 1, 18 into 2 is the way to think about uh, all cultures, but certainly our, our current uh, context, not just in the U.S., but across the world, this is what's happening. That's great. Well, as we bring our discussion to the ground here, John, what what would a pastor who is busy serving benefit by having this article by Bill Edgar on his oh. desk this week, and he read it, what oh. might be some takeaways that would just shape his thinking, his preaching, and his life? Any thoughts come to mind? Well, I think... Uh, not only the content, the specifics of the article, that you know, equips a pastor on what to think about the culture he's, that he's preaching to and uh, ministering to, but as with you know, so many of our professors, it's not just what they say, but how they get there. Mm. And I think one of the things that Bill gives to us, as you've just heard Scott give to us in the way he does things, is it's not just what comes out at the end, but what's the methodology? And um, if you're going to be equipped to be a pastor, not just in the next five minutes, but for the next 40 years, you need the methodology. And I think what you see in what Bill does uh, and how he gets to his conclusions and how he gets to his and answers the questions is uh, how do you think about these things? Not only what to think, but how do you think? And so I think the article actually equips pastors uh, as does our, our apologetic approach and uh, our connection of biblical theology to culture. Uh, I think it equips a pastor to know uh, not just what he should be thinking, but how we should get there and how we should help his people to get there. That's good. So, so Todd, is Bill Edgar a good church historian? Did he make any blunders here? He you might know, be watching this. So I, I, I really, I, appre <laughs> I appreciate his whole approach. Uh, I really did. I, I love how he started in the museum and talked about that issue of the church, and I loved how he ended on the issue of the the individual <clears throat> perception of truth and the crisis in the modern world. And he ended on art and the impressionists as seeing light in their own light. Whereas the mm -hmm. Christian, the Christian must see all things in the light of God. Mm -hmm. And so in his light, we see light. So it's a, it's not lost on me that the impressionism of the 1890s terminates into the hodgepodge of, of, of abstract art by the mm -hmm. mid 20th century and the chaos of the Babylon city. Um, it's striking to me that the, 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 the emphasis on the, the importance of seeing the truth 
and the truth objectively, transcendently in God through his word mm. to us. And so what's going to help the pastor, I think, continue to fight against uh, any sort of idolatry in his own heart and in the lives of his congregants is to continue to bring people back to the word of God, to continue to, to keep confidence in that. The secular has lost confidence in itself and in all other authorities. And so to be able to bring people back to the God who is there, to use Schaefer, mm -hmm. and to speak in these in these utmost terms, I think is, is such a helpful point. I think Edgar, Dr. Edgar helps us so much, and I really appreciated terminating on that question on the play on light, because it, it's not lost on me that we live in an age where we want to be our own light. Mm -hmm. um, and we've always lived since the fall in an age that wanted to be their own light. So the so modern is the now. So, Scott, uh, if, if Bill were here, what would he say other than, well, you're embarrassing me by praising my work so much? But what do we say? You missed something. You should have talked about this. Is there anything that comes to mind as you think about it? Well, Bill's encouragement to me has always been, make sure this continues. Make sure we continue to have a solid biblical cultural understanding and then biblical cultural critique available mm -hmm. to our students because this is the world they're going to go into yeah. and this is what they're going to need. I think he would say, keep it up, keep guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So would you recommend this book to anybody? I would recommend this book to everybody. Wow, that's good. How about you, Todd? Yes, I would recommend this book. Um, the, it's such a helpful tool and resource. Okay. Pastors need this on their shelves, right? They do. You got some great pastor teachers, pastor scholars who are giving you the fruit of the decades of labors. Really worth it. So, so I think about it and say, Bill knocked it out of the park on the first pitch, and yeah. we got two other uh, articles I want to talk, and they're extraordinary too. Together, they make a phenomenal book. This should be a bestseller in my opinion, but I'm biased. Yeah. So, what can I say? <laughs> well, thanks a lot, guys. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thanks. Thanks.